So far in class, we've focused on the negatives of online life. However, if being online were a lousy, painful experience all the time, then we probably wouldn't be using it. But it's not lousy. I've spent countless hours on YouTube, Reddit, Twitch, and even Facebook. Therefore, I think it's time that we talk about some of the revolutionary positives of the internet. And even if the general experience were lousy for some reason, there would still be some important benefits to the dissemination of information via the internet. For one, it would reduce the power wielded by traditional gatekeepers of information, such as newspaper and news media editors. For the most part, this seems like a good thing. By opening up the media via the internet, it seems obvious that the information created and spread will likely be, in many ways, more relevant to the interests of consumers of media. Oh, for sure. Before, we were all slaves to an exclusive group of editors who curated information for us, which was undemocratic. But now I can jump onto YouTube, Reddit, a forum, or someone's personal blog and explore all of my niche interests with like-minded individuals who freely choose to share what they love. Not only does the decentralization of the internet empower ordinary people to share their voice about everything under the sun, but it also taps into what's often referred to as the wisdom of the crowds. For instance, blogs were crucial for gathering information during the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. And Twitter and Facebook were instrumental in coordinating the Arab Spring in 2011. Live updates from individuals about what was happening on the ground gave us a fuller picture of what was unfolding during those events. In fact, I myself relied on MIT's nuclear science and engineering blog during the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011 when I lived in Japan. Would you say that without it, you would have had a meltdown? Oh boy. For those of you listening, I'm face palming real hard right now. Yeah, I knew it as soon as I said it. Getting back to the point at hand, the dissemination of information via the internet allows us to utilize the information created not only to give us a fuller explanation of things as they happen, but it also gives us a better way to predict events than the alternatives. For example, SirWiki explains that the wisdom of the crowd can give us better predictions about the number of jelly beans in a jar or the winner of a horse race than an individual's predictions can. That's not to say that the wisdom of the crowd is always superior, but it does highlight that in the right circumstances, it can be. And that's another reason to be optimistic about the internet's influence on information dissemination. Yes, and finding the information you want is astoundingly easy now. Before, you'd have to go to a library, wander through the stacks, and leaf through books. Or, you'd have to subscribe to certain publications. Now you just Google what you want to know about and you subscribe to or follow your favorite social media channels or personalities. And you sign up for forums and subreddits that pertain to your interests. And a lot of this information is free, whereas you would have had to pay for a lot of the relevant subscriptions and things before. Not only is this generally good for consumers, but it potentially opens up a lot of the world to the people who could afford such things least. Right. Plenty of news and entertainment are available at no cost now. I'm sure many of you have already spent hours during this pandemic watching videos on YouTube and TikTok for, for free. free. But that's not to say that it's all sunshine and rainbows and... What are the things that are good? Sunshine and rainbows and cat videos? We are on the internet after all, right? Right. One potential problem to consider is that, in general, the wisdom of the crowd only really works well if the individuals involved are as independent as possible. But the more linked we are to one another in these internet networks, the less independent we are, and this seems like a general problem. Consider the following analogy, the circular ant mill. So, ants aren't the smartest individual animals out there, but when they work together in colonies, these colonies are amazingly effective and efficient problem-solving entities. One thing that sometimes happens is an ant won't know what its job is. And when this happens, it follows a rule. Follow the ant in front of you. In many cases, this works out well for the colony. But in some cases, 
what happens is that this leads to a sort of ant mill in which the ants follow each other in circles until eventually all of the ants die. Yes, and while it's easy to laugh at ants for being dumb anthropods with rudimentary nervous systems, <laughs> even us humans, with our supposedly advanced and sophisticated ape brains, are vulnerable to similar behaviors. We see this online with filter bubbles and echo chambers. In order for us to get deeper into the discussion about internet media and information, we'll first have to know a bit about these two concepts. A filter bubble is, essentially, the state you find yourself in as a result of filtering out views and ideas that compete with the ones that you currently hold. For example, imagine that we start a group called Utilitarians Unite, and the only members of the group are utilitarians. We will see a lot of agreement expressed from the members, and very little, if any, disagreement. This may cause us to overestimate our confidence in the truth of utilitarianism. Sometimes, mass agreement can point us to a reason to increase our confidence. But in this case, the agreement that we see is just an effect of the selection criteria for our Facebook group. In other words, in this scenario, we find ourselves in a filter bubble, where non-utilitarian ideas are excluded through omission. One important thing to keep in mind is that we can find ourselves in these filter bubbles as the result of both intentional actions and also as the result of actions that we don't have control over. We might, for instance, intentionally remove competing voices from our news feeds and timelines because they make us uncomfortable. But also, we can find ourselves in these sorts of bubbles as a result of algorithmic personalization. Luckily, it's somewhat straightforward, in principle, how to break out of these. Search out and consider the views, ideas, etc. of the positions that have been omitted. Right. It's important to emphasize that escaping a filter bubble is a matter of finding other views. More dangerous than filter bubbles are echo, echo chambers. chambers. Echo chambers are social structures from which other relevant voices have been actively discredited. A filter bubble merely does not include other contrary views. An echo chamber actively pushes its members to distrust outsiders. So what do echo chambers look like online? There are plenty of examples, such as climate change deniers, flat earthers, incels, and all sorts of conspiracy theorists. The common thread amongst them all is that they dismiss, deride, or otherwise downplay anyone who holds viewpoints that conflict with their own. This can happen overtly through mockery or character assassination of critics and their sympathizers, or it can happen covertly by suppression or censoring of conflicting viewpoints. The behavior is similar to what occurs in cults, where opposing viewpoints are treated as taboo, and even entertaining them can bring scorn upon oneself. Something that's worth noting about echo chambers is summed up well by C. T. Nguyen, a philosopher at Utah Valley University. He says, Here is the real source of irrationality in lifelong echo chamber members, and it turns out to be incredibly subtle. Those caught in an echo chamber are giving far too much weight to the evidence they encounter first, just because it's first. Rationally, they should reconsider their beliefs without that arbitrary preference. There are a number of things that should be of interest to us ethicists about both filter bubbles and echo chambers. For example, some folks argue that because the relevant gatekeepers of the internet are not people, their algorithms and computer processes, that these gatekeepers are free from bias. But this doesn't seem quite right. Even though the filtering is being done by algorithms and computer processors, human bias can enter the picture. For example, the information that a search engine like Google shows users has to pull its information from somewhere. They have to crawl websites and look for relevant information. But not every website is indexed by these search engines. Google, for example, may not analyze a particular website because it deems that site to be too similar to other sites, or because the site is suspected to be illegal, or because the setup of the website would make algorithmic processing of its information too difficult to analyze practically. But, importantly, the measures by which the search engine determines which sites are too similar to others, are likely illegal, etc., all must be programmed by humans, 
which leads to the possibility that these measures are, in some way, biased. It's also the case that because these filtering actions are automated, they can be altered by third parties. Look at how important and lucrative and advanced the field of search engine optimization has become for businesses. These are just a couple of ways that biases can be inherent in the information filtered on the basis of non-human internet gatekeepers. At this point, it's a good idea to pause and reflect on ethical questions about filter bubbles and echo chambers. How do they affect our autonomy? How do they impact overall well-being? How do they influence our character and the ways we relate to and interact with each other? Would we accept the technologies that enable filter bubbles and echo chambers if, knowing their effects, we could go back to when those technologies were invented? Right. And for any of these questions, if you think that there are morally problematic dimensions to the answers, there are still further questions. What should we do in light of the answers? For example, if you think that filter bubbles reduce one's autonomy, what should we do as individuals to address this? Should we go through all of our social media accounts and scrutinize our personalization filters if we're allowed to? If we're not allowed to do so by a particular site or app, should we stop engaging with it? We might also think about what we should do as a society about these things. Should we legally mandate that search engines can only personalize results in particular ways? Should we outlaw black hat manipulation of search engines and social media sites? These are all good questions, but one further complicating feature of this discussion is that even though they are separate concepts and phenomena, there is a crucial link between filter bubbles and echo chambers, which returns us to the point made by Wynn brought up earlier that the order in which one sees information is likely to matter to whether one becomes entrenched in an echo chamber. Nope. Fake, Fake news. news. Academics like you are always spouting lies. <laughs> what a perfect example of how an echo chamber works. Anyway, what happens when you become entrenched in an echo chamber is that you're exposed to a particular viewpoint that resonates with you. Then, you consume more and more content that supports that viewpoint while never being exposed to alternative views. Usually, the content gradually becomes more and more extreme. There are plenty of examples online of how YouTube's autoplay feature has contributed to this entrenchment. You might start off watching a video that criticizes a single aspect of feminism, then several videos later, you end up watching a misogynistic red pill video that explicitly warns you against feminist, feminist lies, lies and, manipulation. and manipulation. That is to say that filter bubbles can lead one to become trapped in an echo chamber. What's critical is an early intervention before your views become entrenched. Early exposure to alternative views is likely to rescue you from a filter bubble before you're trapped in an echo chamber and may even prevent you from being trapped in a filter bubble to begin with. If you do fall into an echo chamber, then escaping from it might require a social reboot, which is another idea from Wynn. A social reboot is a more extreme intervention that helps you escape from an echo chamber. Basically, the sort of thing Wynn has in mind when discussing a social reboot is the following. To start the reboot, the relevant person should suspend all of their beliefs. Then, slowly, they should begin adding back some of those beliefs by trusting their senses, trusting other people, etc. Importantly, they have to consider all sources of information equally that can't revert to their previous ranking of trustworthiness versus untrustworthiness. Wynn gives the example of a prominent neo-Nazi, Derek Black, who had been indoctrinated with Nazi ideology by his father as he grew up. Black had become entrenched in an echo chamber, even becoming the star of a popular neo-Nazi radio talk show and propagating distrust of alternative viewpoints. It was not until a Jewish student at his college invited Black to Shabbat dinners that he began questioning his ideology. Black then abandoned his beliefs and broadly immersed himself in other viewpoints, exposing himself to pop culture, Arabic literature, mainstream media, and rap with an open mind and trust. One question you might ask is, how do we get folks to go through this sort of reboot? Won't their entrenchment in the echo chamber prevent this sort of thing from happening? The quick answer from Wynn is yes, but 
In order to set the scene for the reboot to take place, we have to attack not the information the individual sees, but the system of discredit that fostered distrust of outside sources to begin with. Yes, and there are even more ethical questions we can ask here. Should we intervene? Are we morally required to? How strongly are we allowed to intervene? What methods of intervention are morally permissible? These are important questions for us to explore, especially since finding filter bubbles in echo chambers online will require designing and developing new technologies. It would be silly for us to solve one set of problems and introduce a new set of problems in doing so. We'll leave these questions open for you all to discuss. Ha! Gotti! Ha! Gotti! Ha!